Welcome to this edition of IPA Encounters. My name is John Roskam and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs. Today, I'm talking with one of the English-speaking world's fiercest, most passionate, most committed advocates and voices for freedom, Toby Young. We'll be discussing the condition of freedom in the world. We'll be talking about what lockdowns around the world have done to our freedoms. We'll be talking about the role of the media. We'll be talking about cancel culture and, of course, education and what can we do to restore our freedoms. I'm speaking to you today from the Bailu Meyer Media Studio in the IPA offices in Melbourne, and Toby is speaking with us from London. As an IPA member, you're watching this edition of IPA Encounters Live, and you've had the opportunity to ask questions of Toby. We've received some dozens of such questions, and what we've done is we've distilled them to a few key themes that we'll be talking about with Toby today. Let me now introduce Toby. As it happens, Toby and I were speaking on the email in early 2020 about Toby potentially coming to the IPA, to Australia as a guest of the IPA, and of course, events conspired against that happening. Despite the title of Toby's 2001 best-selling memoir, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, subsequently made into a successful film and a play, Toby's career has been one of achievement and success. Toby originally left school at 16 and then returned, matriculated, and then was mistakenly sent a acceptance form for Oxford University. Oxford University then felt unable to retract that offer. Toby attended Oxford, qualified with first-class honours in philosophy, politics and economics, then worked at The Times for six months before um, his services were dispensed with as he impersonated the editor and did a number of other things. This didn't stop Toby from winning a Fulbright scholarship, studying at Harvard, University and then teaching at Cambridge University. Toby started a cultural magazine, then moved to New York to work at Vanity Fair. Toby has written comedies, he's written plays, he was a restaurant reviewer for the Evening Standard and a judge on Top Chef. Toby is currently the associate editor of The Spectator and a daily writer, a regular writer for the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph. In 2011, Toby was the co-founder of the West London Free School, which we'll be talking about today. And in 2020, very importantly, Toby founded the Free Speech Union, which we'll also be discussing. Toby is the founder of the website Lockdown Skeptics, which is now the Daily Skeptic. And it has as its message, wonderful words, question everything, Stay sane, live free. Toby's Substack account is devoted to the football team. He supports Queen's Park Rangers in London. And just a few hours ago, Toby filed a wonderful match report on the game that was played yesterday. Finally, Toby with James Dellingpole participates in my very favourite podcast, London Calling. I listen to it religiously every Tuesday and it is one of the highlights of my week. To give you a flavour of the podcast for those of you who don't know it yet, let me just read Toby's description from this week. In this special Easter weekend edition of London Calling, James and I talk about the Archbishop of Canterbury's unwelcome intervention in the immigration debate, the Church of England's refusal to ordain Calvin Robinson, QPR's games on Good Friday and the bank holiday, James's hesitation about embracing the chemtrails conspiracy theory, Joe Biden's imaginary friend, the sinking of the Moskva and how the war in Ukraine is going well or badly for Putin, and in Culture Corner, the BBC's Platinum Jubilee reading list, Slow Horses, Operation Mincemeat, Flying Colours and The Ship. 
that basically covers all the big issues. A few weeks ago in Culture Corner, Toby had a wonderful discussion about two of my favourite characters from literature, Richard Sharp and Horatio Hornblower. So that is London Calling and we'll be talking about that at the end of this discussion. Toby, there is so much more I could say, but welcome to this edition of IPA Encounters. Thank you very much, John. As, as I mentioned, Toby, we've received dozens of questions about many topics which we'll be talking about, but can I begin by asking a question that many have posed, which is, Toby, with your experience in the media, in journalism, in writing, your family's history, how did you come to be the warrior for freedom that you are? Well, I guess um, I became um, an, an... It started when I was about 13, I think, when um, I was a punk rocker. And I thought of myself at the time as an anarchist. And um, I think I've gone on a relatively short political journey. Um, so as an anarchist, um, I sort of morphed into a sort of small state libertarian conservative. And for that reason, uh, supported Margaret Thatcher when she became prime minister in 1979. Um, and was rather surprised, actually, when David Cameron became prime minister in 2010 and um, embarked on a pro program of trying to reduce uh, public expenditure. Some of the people at the forefront of the protests in London protesting about those cuts were self-described anarchists, which slightly baffled me. I thought, well, hang on a second. If you're an anarchist like I used to be, why do you want the state to be larger? Surely you should be applauding the Prime Minister's efforts to reduce the size of the state. As an anarchist, don't you want to roll back the frontiers of the state, like me? But weirdly, um, anarchist, there's a kind of um, schizophrenia, I think, within the um, anarchist political movement, and they can be quite pro-big state and pro-censorship, uh, in spite of describing themselves as anarchists. Um, the particular reason I set up the Free Speech Union was because I myself was um, cancelled um, at the beginning of 2018. So Theresa May, then the Prime Minister, appointed me to a very minor public role. I was one of 15 non-executive directors of a new higher education regulator in England. Um, and um, within hours of this being announced, the offence archaeologists went to work sifting through everything I'd said or written, looking for evidence that I was an unsuitable person. And um, uh, it didn't take them long to find it because, you know, I've been a journalist for, you know, 35 plus years. And uh, I was, you know, the, 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 it was initially a kind of Twitter storm, which then kind of spilt over. It was a slow news week, uh, spilt over into the mainstream media. And um, within a week, um, a petition um, had been started with over a quarter of a million signatures demanding that Theresa May throw me under a bus. Um, there was a mob of journalists on my doorstep waiting for, to see whether I'd resign or not. Uh, there was an emergency debate in the House of Commons about my suitability to serve on this regulator. Um, and I ended up stepping down and um, stupidly <laughs> apologising for some of the more sophomoric things I'd said on Twitter, you know, after a couple of glasses of wine late at night, and thought that would draw a line under the whole affair. But that turned out to be, um, you know, the equivalent of throwing raw meat to a shoal of piranha fish. So as soon as I'd stepped down from this new role, they then came after me um, uh, in all my other roles. And I ended up having to resign from five jobs, including my main day job, which paid the mortgage, running a, a charity for people who wanted to set up schools. Um, and um, so I was well and truly cancelled. Um, and um, when I went through that experience, I became acutely aware that there wasn't a professional body I could turn to for, you know, good impartial advice about um, the law PR, should I or shouldn't I apologise? Would that make things worse or better? And if I was going to apologise, how should I word it? Uh, there was no, you know, even though my friends for the most part were pretty good at sticking by me, nonetheless, you do feel quite isolated when you are targeted by an outrage mob for cancellation. And people are a bit reluctant to, you know, 
um, put their heads above the parapet and defend you in public because then, of course, you know, they become targets themselves. Um, and I thought, well, after I'd kind of recovered from this onslaught, I thought, well, someone should really set up an organisation uh, which can provide people who find themselves in the firing line for having, you know, said something silly um, uh, in the past or something that wasn't controversial 10 years ago, but is now controversial because the Everton window has shifted to the left. Um, uh, uh, an organisation that can provide people who find themselves in that situation with a bit of support, a bit of advice, um, a bit of solidarity. And so that was really the wellspring of the idea for the Free Speech Union. And, and we'll talk about the union. Can we talk about how you felt when this occurred to you? So you'd been in the public eye high profile, there's someone like you who this happens to, how did you respond and how would someone, we can speculate, who is not familiar with the media respond? Because one of the things the Free Speech Union has done is help and support people who are not Toby Young, people who are just doing their jobs, who say something about the Black Lives Matter protest, for example, and then they're cancelled in the way that, that you were. At first, John, it felt sort of um, like a kind of comedy. Um, you know, it was just so ridiculous, um, the stuff that people were dredging up and trying to cancel me for. So, I mean, I'll give you just one example. Uh, I wrote a piece in The Spectator in 2001 arguing that um, Britain's uh, censorship laws should be liberalised um, uh, and um, and I and I talked about how the liberal the more liberal censorship regime in Scandinavian countries um, actually uh, 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 hadn't produced a kind of rash of sexual assaults, um, uh, uh, but actually seemingly had had the opposite effect. One of the arguments against uh, uh, reducing censorship of pornography is that if you make it more widely available, you're going to kind of uh, turn men crazy. You know, they're going to go around assaulting people if their brains, their reptil reptile brains are stimulated in that way. And the evidence from Scandinavia suggested otherwise. Um, and, uh, and so I sort of wrote this, this sort of ago. slightly tongue-in-cheek piece about sort of why why um, uh, pornography should be more widely available in the UK. And um, a, a, a mischievous sub-editor at The Spectator um, put the headline on the top of the piece, Confessions of a Porn Addict, um, uh, because in the piece I described Philip Larkin, the former, what the, the, the late poet, probably the, the, the most celebrated poet of the Second World War, as a fellow porn addict. It was a throwaway line. I'm not actually a porn addict um, in the in the article. But anyway, that's, that's what the sub-editor put at the top. And um, the offence archaeologist trawled through everything I'd ever written in The Spectator um, and found this article with this headline on it. Someone took a screenshot of it, put it on Twitter. And then, uh, like, hours later, um, a piece appeared in the Evening Standard, um, you know, Theresa May under under renewed pressure as new university czar confesses to being porn addict. And, um, and then that was repeated in the Times um, uh, the following day, uh, not the front page, but close to it. And th that was the kind of level of kind of wild exaggeration and kind of negative spin put on everything I'd said or written. I mean, it was like being confronted with an army of the least charitable readers you could possibly imagine, just determined to read everything in the worst possible light. Uh, and um, and so at first it seemed quite funny. I was like, well, how could anyone take this seriously? This is just absurd. And I started taking notes, thinking I can turn this into, you know, an amusing comic novel about a Tory politician who comes a cropper when someone discovers, you know, what he said on Twitter 10 years ago. And um, but then it sort of it, it, it began to gather a, a momentum and this, you know, petition was created. And uh, my kids started being asked questions about why I was in the news by their classmates and my daughter ended up um, uh, feeling she was unable to go to school um, and um, my wife at one point said to me if, if someone else comes up to me with a concerned look on their face and says um, how are you doing are you okay I'm gonna punch them she said <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, so it gradually kind of uh, did become kind of um, uh, quite um, uh, irksome and unpleasant and um, and that's why I, I, I stepped down and resigned hoping that that would just end it and of course it just made things 10 times worse 
And I think if the Free Speech Union had existed at that time, I, I you know, I would have advised myself um, not to apologise um, and probably just to stick it out. Uh, I mean, one of the mistakes I think people often make when they find themselves under this kind of pressure um, uh, is that they 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 voluntarily resign. They don't wait to be fired. And that actually makes life a lot easier for the organisations or the companies that they're associated with. Um, they don't have to take the difficult decision about whether or not to fire them. I mean, I, I don't know whether the government would have forced me uh, to, would have sacked me from this um, uh, regulator, but possibly not. So uh, I think you, you, you can, you can if you're kind of thick-skinned enough, kind of brazen these things out. I mean, often it's a kind of judgment call and sometimes apologising can actually make things better, though very rarely um but it would have been great to have had um uh, you know an organization i could have turned to with a legal department um a press department um and also an organization that could have put me in touch with other people who'd been through similar experiences that's one of the things we do i think it's it's more you know it, it's it's like um uh, you know you're watching your career go up in flames in front of you. I mean, it's like literally you find yourself standing in a burning building. Um, you know, everything you've built, uh, in my case, over, you know, 35 plus years. And I was, you know, on various charitable boards. I'd set up this um, umbrella charity within which these various schools, four schools were sitting. I'd also helped set up those schools. Um, uh, you know, I, I had uh, I had a kind of complicated, multifaceted career, which I'd built um, painstakingly over the past 35 years. And literally it was, it was, it was, it, it had turned into a kind of dumpster fire. And, um, and you kind of think, well, what the hell do I do? How do I put it out? You know, um, uh, everything I'm doing to try and put it out just seems to make things work. Worse. And it is, it, it, you know, you're inevit inevitably, you do begin to panic and kind of despair. Uh, and you desperately want some people who know what they're doing and know what they're talking about to advise you on how you put the damn thing out. Because, you know, at the end of it, there's just gonna, it's just going to be, you know, a smoldering pile of ashes. You have to start again, which when you're, you know, in your mid to late 50s with uh, four teenage kids and um, a pretty big mortgage is a pretty horrifying prospect. There's a few aspects from what you just mentioned, did you have any defenders? Were there any people, you use the wonderful term, the offence archaeologists, were there any people who said, look, this is 20 years ago, this is ridiculous, it was said in jest, there's no one better qualified to be a non-executive director of this organisation than Toby Young. If anyone's passionate about education and the opportunity it provides for young people, it's Toby. We have to stand and defend him. This is where we fight. Yeah, I did have some defenders. Um uh, so um, the then um, Minister for Education, um, Joe Johnson, Boris Johnson's younger brother, um, he'd been involved in my appointment to the Office for Students. And um, uh, when, when an emergency question about my appointment um, was um, granted um, debate time in the House of Commons by the wonderful John Burko, um, uh, um, he, he, he stood up and defended me. And shortly afterwards, he had to resign as education minister. And everyone thought that um, he had to resign because defending me was the kind of nail in his coffin. Um, uh, but uh, I think, you know, pe people, you know, your friends for the most part stand by you. And I I did, I, I didn't have many complaints. Uh, you know, one or two um, kind of turned on me. Um, uh, and one person who initially defended me then retracted his defence of me and said he had no idea, you know, just how awful some of the things I'd said were when he initially defended me and now he knew the full story he was withdrawing his defense so that was even worse than him not defending me at all that was pretty shocking um but uh yeah louis ck the american stand-up when he was cancelled said people tell you when something terrible like this happens that you find out who your real friends are and he said that's true but unfortunately it was the wrong half um, but that that, that, I, that wasn't my experience. In my experience, it was very much the right half. And um, uh, yeah, Fraser Nelson, for instance, the um, editor of The Spectator, uh, he did defend me. Um, he didn't fire me and uh, he didn't ask me to uh, give up my Spectator column, which I've been doing, you know, since um, the late 90s. Uh, so that was a relief. And I was still able to, you know, um, uh, carry on working as a journalist and earning a living as a journalist. It just meant I effectively had to kind of give up all my educational work, uh, which was, you know, which was a wrench because I devoted 10 years of my life to it. And when this happens to someone who's not you, someone who's not familiar with the, the media, 
So you mentioned um, that perhaps they shouldn't apologise or should think about apologising. Um, what would someone in that situation go through given what happened to you? Well, um, I'll give you an example of someone we helped um, at the Free Speech Union um, uh, in two, in 2020. So a guy called Nick Buckley, um, who set up a charity in Manchester to work with um, uh, young homeless people. Um, uh, at the height of the BLM protests, um, he wrote a blog post for LinkedIn on his LinkedIn account in which he questions some of the um, more extreme policies of the um, uh, BLM movement, such as wanting to defund the police, uh, dismantle the nuclear family, end capitalism, um, and uh, and said, you know, is this really uh, an organisation that um, uh, we want to get behind, even if we even if we are anti racists, and um, and he said that he thought some of their rhetoric uh, was quite divisive, and actually might exacerbate racial tensions in Manchester amongst young people whom he'd been working with for the past twenty years or so, and not actually improve race relations. You know, very moderate, reasonable points, um, uh, but but at that particular time, that was absolute heresy. And um, some BLM activists discovered this blog, found out that he'd started this charity in Manchester, started a petition demanding he be fired from the charity he himself had set up. Uh, it got less than 400 signatures, but the trustees of the charity panicked and fired him. And um, initially, you know, he was uh, you know, knocked for six by this. Um, uh, and um, uh, but then I contacted him and said, you know, I've set up this organization. It was set up to help people like you. Uh, I think I can help you. And um, uh, and what we did was I found him a pro bono charity lawyer who then looked at the uh, governing documents of his charity and his contract with the charity and discovered that um, he had an open ended employment contract, uh, which meant that and he hadn't been fired uh, in a proper way. So the trustees were effectively on the hook for um, his unpaid salary up until something like 2029. Um, and they couldn't get out of it by resigning and dissolving the charity. And when we pointed this out to them, um, they they one by one resigned. And eventually um, he was reinstated. Um, uh, and uh, he's now a, um, a, a great um, uh, defender um, uh, f of the Free Speech Union. But uh, yeah, we managed to get we managed to get him his old job back. We started a, we helped promote a rival petition which got you know fifteen thousand signatures, um, and um, uh, so that that was an early success. But uh, we've been able to do that um, you know over a hundred times I think. Sim similarly, intervene to help people. Often, um, if you if you involve lawyers, if you threaten to go to law or go to law, that often does um, uh, help. A good deal. I mean, one of the things we've discovered is that um, you know um, people people who want to cancel people for almost always it's for exercising their lawful right to free speech, but but saying something that people disagree with and disapprove of. Um, they like to hunt in packs, um, and if you stand up to them, um, uh, if if you say no, I'm I'm not going to cave in to these demands. Um, I think you're wrong and I'm willing to defend what I've said and I've got these people standing by me who are willing to defend it too and my right to say it. Often the mob will just disperse. I mean, I've been amazed by how often um, uh, we the, the, the mob has just disappeared, just withered away as soon as you stand up to them and push back robustly. And I guess it's, you know, it's the same, it's the story the world over. Uh, bullies um, uh, rely on uh, the 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 people they bully not standing up to them, being intimidated and scared, and no one around them being willing to defend them. But if you do stand up to them, if if you make it clear that you have uh, an army which is at least as big as theirs, and every bit as determined to fight for what they believe, uh, often they'll just disperse. They'll just go away. They'll back down. And one of the things we need to talk about is establishing a branch of the union here in Australia. Can I now move on to a topic related to freedom of speech and, and freedoms. You set up a wonderful website, a wonderful blog that here in Australia, thousands, tens of thousands of people looked at every day during the lockdowns, during the government response to COVID. Lockdown skeptic, now the daily skeptic. What happened in your view 
during the COVID pandemic? What prompted the government's reactions? What prompted the reaction of governments around the world to basically disregard our basic freedoms in the way that they did? Yeah, well, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question, John. Um, and there are various um, theories. One of the differences between James Delingpole and me, which we often debate on London Calling, is that he is a conspiracy theorist. He thinks it was all planned. He calls it the pandemic. He thinks that a cabal of evil billionaires led by Bill Gates um, were planning something like this for, for years. And they seized on this opportunity to essentially... Um, undermine our liberty <laughs> and, then sen- and censor our freedoms and censor our freedom of speech to even argue about alternatives to lockdowns. Yeah, that was one of the most um, uh, shocking aspects of the whole thing. I mean, I- I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I- I'm, I- I'm, I'm a subscriber to the cock-up theory of history. And um, I think what happened around the world is that uh, governments were faced with these scary pictures coming out of Wuhan in China, followed by pictures of um, hospitals being overwhelmed in um, Italy, um, uh, having to be accommodated on stretchers in hospital corridors, and uh, they panicked. Um, uh, And instead of uh, sticking to their own um, uh, pandemic strategies, which have been worked out over many years, indeed, instead of sticking to what the original World Health Organization advice was the last time they drew up a document about how government should cope with another pandemic in 2019, uh, they recommended against quarantining healthy people in their homes, closing businesses, closing schools, etc. All of that, all of that was thrown out of the window by panicking politicians and officials, um, I think, who thought, crikey, you know, um, uh, this is um, a dangerous pandemic. Um, uh, we, there's probably not much we can do um, to prevent transmission, uh, but we have to be seen to be doing something because otherwise um, we'll be blamed for unnecessary deaths. Uh, and I think a lot of um, uh, so the, the scientific advisors, public health officials, advising governments, um, uh, they, all, they, they immediately saw this as an opportunity uh, to massively increase their profiles and their influence. Um, and they recommended various things which they probably weren't convinced would work, but nonetheless, there was uh, there was there was an audience for their for those recommendations and after one or two governments uh, locked down I and mean, I think it, it started in China and then it happened in Italy uh, then governments around the world within about a two week window decided to follow that same draconian policy that was suddenly became the default kind of go to response in spite of the absence of evidence that quarantining the healthy as well as the sick um, issuing stay-at-home orders, shutting down businesses, closing schools, turning hospitals into COVID-only emergency facilities. There was no evidence that that was actually going to make any uh, difference at all, very little evidence. It was all based on speculative modelling, which we know is kind of highly unreliable. Um, uh, and there was no uh, there was no effort to try and estimate what the cost of any of these policies was likely to be. Um, uh, in, in, in the UK, there was no cost-benefit analysis at all before uh, imposing the first lockdown. Um, you know, masks initially, the conclusion was, no, there's no evidence masks will make the slightest bit of difference. Don't bother with masks. Suddenly that changed. And again, I think it wasn't because the evidence changed, just because governments thought, well, we need to be doing something. We need to be seen to be doing something. We need a story to tell in two, three years' time for we're next before the electorate uh, about what we did to try and mitigate the impact of this of this pandemic. And I think it was just a, an absolute global catastrophe. Um, Um, uh, You know, governments across the world made things uh, much, much worse um, by um, uh, imposing this completely untested policy, which had um, dire unintended consequences. Um, uh, And uh, I think in years to come, historians are going to be looking back and thinking, you know, this is probably the most disastrous policy um, ever implemented by governments. How how on earth did it happen? How can we avoid making this this mistake again? How do we avoid making this mistake again? And how do we avoid Western democracies, as you've just explained, uh, imposing policies practiced by totalitarian communist regimes? Yeah, well, that Have was we one learned of the, the lessons? Um, 
oddities of, uh, of, of, of the past two years. Um, why did Western liberal democracies essentially copy the policy response of a communist dictatorship? Uh, I mean, there was, a, there, was a, there was a very telling interview um, that Neil Ferguson, um, who was uh, 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 one of the leading epidemiological modelers um, whose uh, famous paper uh, influenced the British government to lock down, pre predicting kind of apocalyptic consequences uh, if the government didn't lock down, based entirely on, on his uh, modelling projections. Uh, he gave an interview to the Times in which he said that initially he and his colleagues um, thought that the Chinese response, in which people were literally barricaded in their homes, uh, uh, literally planks of wood nailed to their front doors so they couldn't leave their apartments. And we're seeing a very similar um, uh, policy currently unfolding in Shanghai at the moment. But he thought that was the right policy response. And if only, you know, um, we weren't constrained by um, pesky constitutional laws and a tradition of liberty in the West, then we could we could follow this 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 response. Uh, and then he said in this interview, and then I realised that 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 you know me and my colleagues had wildly overestimated. I mean, I'm not quoting this exactly, but it was something along the lines of we had wildly overestimated the attachment to liberty, and the and 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 and, and um, j just just we, we thought that governments would be unwilling to order people, you know, to, to place them under virtual house arrest and to close schools uh, and, and to initiate uh, business closures that would result in catastrophic economic harm. We naively thought that governments would be unwilling to do this, um, but we were wrong and we were delighted to be wrong. Turned out that um, uh, attachment, the attachment to liberty uh, uh, across the West wasn't nearly as deep-seated as we'd feared um, and, uh, and governments weren't nearly as squeamish as we as we'd feared about um, placing entire populations under virtual house arrest, in fact, effectively shutting down national health services and turning them into COVID only emergency services, uh, we were delighted to discover that actually they were perfectly willing to 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 to, to copy the uh, communist dictatorship uh, in China. Hallelujah! What, what and, does you know, that and, say and, about and, freedom? <laughs> what does that say? And I I, I think. Neil Ferguson is right in that regard. What does that say about our attachment to freedom around the Western world? I, I think, I mean, it's tempting. It's tempting to kind of um, uh, be plunged into despair about this um, and to conclude um, that in the relatively affluent uh, West, um, people are now much more concerned about um, their safety and their health and their security than they are about their liberty. And um, they are now willing to sacrifice uh, their liberty uh, in order to um, secure their own safety, particularly when it comes to public health. But I think that um, uh, I, I'm not as, I'm, I haven't given into that, that despair. I think that um, uh, people panicked um, uh, and I think their willingness to um, support the lockdown policies was partly because um, they were bombarded with propaganda um, by broadcasters, newspapers, governments, public health agencies, wildly exaggerating just how dangerous this particular virus is. And you know, there's plenty of um, survey evidence to suggest that people exaggerated the threat, exaggerated the danger it posed, thought that many, many more people were dying as a result of this virus, the risk of hospitalisation and long-term uh, adverse consequences of being infected were far, far greater than they really were. I think there's a sort of natural human tendency to catastrophize, which was tapped into by these various propaganda agencies. Um, uh, but, it, but it's, uh, you know, uh, I think... Uh, the, we can blame governments and um, you know some of my colleagues in the media for not properly scrutinising some of the uh, wild exaggerations that um, uh, 
uh, uh, government ministers and um, public health officials were making. There was a kind of, you know, the world was sent into a panic um, about just how dangerous this virus was. And they seemed to be willing to sacrifice almost anything, you know, including their firstborn, um, to uh, reduce the risk of catching it themselves. I think if people had known, if people had had had, had, had better information, um, uh, if people had known, had been able to make a kind of uh, a proper informed uh, assessment of the risk, they, they they hope, I think, would have been less willing to give up so many liberties. Why, and one of the questions many people have asked, many IPA members, is what is the role in the, of the media in this? And you've just touched on it. And why was dissent crushed? Why was there no public discussion of alternatives? Why was there no discussion, exactly as you said, of the consequences for young people, of the psychological consequences? So I'm speaking to you from the world's longest lockdown city and we are going to be seeing the consequences in young people for years to come. Why was dissent and debate crushed the way it was? Why, why were you setting up lockdown sceptics? Um, why were you attacked the way you were? Uh, I think there were. Th- I think that there's a kind of... Um, uh, superficial explanation and then probably a deeper explanation the superficial explanation is that um our government and i'm sure your government too went to great lengths to ensure that the um uh, official response the official narrative wasn't challenged so in the uk mm. um ofcom the state broadcast regulator issued some guidance on the same day that the first lockdown was imposed, uh, cautioning broadcasters um, uh, to be very careful when um, uh, inviting people onto the airwaves who were going to challenge the official public health response. Their rationale was that, um, you know, um, if if, if, uh, the Department uh, of Health recommends masks as a way of mitigating the risk of infection and you toby appear on um the bbc uh, to tell people that the evidence that masks actually do reduce your risk of infection is extremely threadbare that might discourage people to wear masks uh, and they just took it for granted that the official public health response the government's response was correct Um, And that if anyone challenged uh, that response, then they would be increasing the risk that people would become infected, hospitalised and die. Uh, So that was a sort of rationale for suppressing uh, dissent. uh, And uh, that was the rationale for Ofcom issuing this quite frightening advice to um, uh, its licensees. Um, uh, And I think um, also um, uh, the British government spent hundreds of millions of pounds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of millions of pounds um, placing adverts on um, in newspapers, magazines, on radio stations, um, essentially promoting their policy response as the correct response. And that made, I think, some newspaper editors, program editors, disinclined to challenge it too robustly. They didn't want to risk losing this advertising. And, you know, the state pays rate card. You know, if you're in the media, you know that, that you'll know what that means. You know, most people, if they're told by a newspaper that it costs £25,000 to take out a full page ad on the back page, they'll say, you know, you've got to be kidding, take a hike and they'll negotiate and they'll end up, end up spending two and a half thousand. Not the Department of Health. The Department of Health, when it's buying ads, will pay rate cut. They'll pay the full price. So, you know, from newspaper editors, this was manna from heaven. And, you know, the, the, the other advertising was falling off a cliff during the lockdown because the economy was tanking. Uh, and so this was manna from heaven, a way of keeping their their, their businesses afloat. Um, so they were reluctant to threaten that by featuring people like me on their pages. But I think, I think so that's all the kind of part of the, the, the superficial explanation, I think. Oh, what, 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 there's one other part of that explanation is that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation actually pay uh, newspapers to employ journalists to promote their point of view. Uh, so the 
you know, numerous uh, British newspapers, if you, if you drill down into the kind of small print on their websites, will disclose that some of their journalists' salaries are actually being paid by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So those journalists aren't likely to challenge the official pandemic response um, uh, when that response is being heavily promoted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Their job is to try and, you know, uh, enforce compliance uh, with uh, with that narrative and to discredit anyone who challenges it but i think that's all that's all that's part of the explanation but i think a more the deeper explanation is it was just groupthink you know amongst the kind of educated intelligentsia the left of center liberal elite um the 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 the, the lockdown was just thought to be the correct scientifically informed response and if you challenged it that meant you were an uneducated science denying trump supporting knuckle dragging troglodyte and no one wants to be seen like that you know it was it was a way of it was a way of signaling yeah, endorsing the lockdown not challenging it smearing and shaming anyone who did was a way of signaling that you were a member of this elite club you were you weren't someone who disregarded scientific advice you weren't someone who placed profits above public health you were a good concerned educated citizen a member of the metropolitan global elite uh, and that's why you supported it it was a kind of perfect opportunity for kind of virtue signaling and status signaling kind of bundled up into one irresistible package and lots of you know, most of my journalistic colleagues are, are see themselves as sort of members of that particular club um, and you know they, they persuaded themselves that they were doing the right thing doing the responsible thing and at the same time signaling that they were a member of this elite club and that anyone who challenged it was someone you know beneath contempt uh, who, who wasn't in their gang and and here in Australia Toby a number of journalists pointed out that COVID provided the opportunity for people to trust the experts this was now the opportunity for people to trust the experts on COVID on climate change on any number of other yeah. issues and they saw it as an opportunity I think I think that that, that was a big part of it too John so um the um the experts you know the meritocratic cognitive elite um uh, had had taken a succession of blows to their authority and legitimacy um you know they they got the um global credit crunch wrong they got the response to the uh, war on terror wrong um uh, and, and you know um uh, uh, globalization which they had embraced as a kind of um uh, 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 economic cure all for the ills of late capitalism uh, uh, wasn't particularly popular with you know um, indigenous working class communities who found themselves you know plunged into precarious employment um, uh, and we saw the populist revolts of 2016 which resulted in brexit over here the election of trump in the united states that 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 flowed from the gradual disillusionment uh, with um, the uh, meritocratic elite. People began to distrust them and think they didn't have uh, the best interests of the people they were supposed to be looking after at heart, but were pursuing their own narrow self-interest uh, and a kind of, you know, um, a kind of moral crusade, which uh, just made ordinary people feel, you know, morally inferior as well as socially inferior to these elites. Uh, and I think the, 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 the elites who saw their kind of um, authority kind of <clears throat> ebbing away saw the pandemic as an opportunity to restore it. You know, finally, here, is a crisis in which you have to turn to the experts for sage advice about how we should best uh, uh, navigate it. Uh, and we saw the same thing with the massive push uh, for the vaccines. You know, here is an example of the best and the brightest riding to our rescue, saving us from this kind of uh, uh, apocalypse. Um, uh, and and so, so they leapt on it, leapt on it as an opportunity to restore that authority as an answer to the kind of populist revolt. Here is an opportunity to put us back on top of our pedestal where we belong in western societies uh, trust the experts again we'll we'll get you through this and i think that was yeah that that has turned out i think probably to be another terrible miscalculation on their part because um as i think uh, you know as i think uh, uh, electorates across the the west come to the conclusion 
that this policy, th- this pandemic was hopelessly mismanaged. Uh, the cure was far, far worse than the disease. Uh, we'll be paying the price for decades to come in terms of economic loss, increased debt, learning loss on the part of children, increased mental health, God knows what else. Uh, I think people will conclude that the expert once again got it completely wrong um, and um, it could end up being the final nail in the coffin of this kind of global international order. Uh, Dan Hannon had a wonderful um, sentence a few weeks ago when he said, very soon we're not going to be able to find a single person who supported lockdowns. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's amazing how quickly the um, tide has turned. Uh, you know, back in 2020, throughout most of 2021, um, <laughs> you know, you, you could have, um, I mean, very, very few people were willing to publicly oppose the lockdowns. I mean, we were a, a small band of brothers. Um, uh, and now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost the major- majority view. I mean, it, now it's actually quite hard, as Dan says, uh, to find anyone willing to kind of, uh, without, without qualification, defend the lockdown policy. Um, uh, yeah, it's extraordinary. It's like the fall of, I compare it to the fall of communism in 1989. So there was this famous anecdote, um, uh, this, this um, uh, celebrated New York Times uh, foreign correspondent and columnist called Johnny Apple. Um, he was dispatched to uh, Europe by the New York Times uh, to cover the collapse of communism after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, he interviewed various people and they were all, you know, people who lived in countries like uh, East Germany. And they were all very enthusiastic about the um, collapse of the um, uh, uh, communist control system and um, the sudden um, uh, 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 revolution that had occurred peaceful revolution across Eastern Europe and eventually in Russia too. Uh, And the New York Times editorial desk said, you know, some of this coverage is a bit one-sided, Johnny. Can you not interview some people who rather regret the fall of the Berlin Wall, some defenders of the old regime? It must have some defenders. There must be some people out there who think we're actually, you know, people are worse off now than they were, you know, last year. And, uh, And he went off and tried to find people willing to defend the recently discredited regime and he couldn't find anyone you know there was virtually there wasn't a single person including former kind of apparatchiks you know they, they, they it was extraordinary um uh, how few defenders um you know that that regime had and and it's it's a bit like um I think there's a parallel with um, the lockdown responses. You know, uh, when everyone was terrified that if they expressed any dissent, they would immediately be smeared as, you know, a far right eugenicist who put profit before people and didn't care about the elderly and the vulnerable. They kept stum. You know, most people kept stum, including uh, dissenting scientists. (coughs) And um, uh, but now that that kind of fear has gone, uh, now that you can say that sort of thing um, without without being penalised or smeared, it's extraordinary how quickly the kind of consensus behind that policy has completely collapsed. Can we move on to another topic, something that you're passionate about, education? We've received many questions about your role in setting up free schools, your suggestions for reform, can the institutions be reformed? So can I begin by just asking you to explain um, how you came to set up the West London Free School, what you were trying to achieve and, and why you did it? Yeah, I, in, in around 2009, um, uh, 2008, 2009, um, I started looking around um, to see where I could send my children to school. I'd had, I had, I had four children, and they were all approaching secondary school age at that point. Um, and there were, there are some good schools um, uh, in Acton, where I live in West London. Um, but in order to get your kids um, into those schools, you either had to be um, a Church of England, a Catholic, or live within a few hundred yards of the school gate. And if you didn't fall into any of those boxes, the choices were pretty bleak. And so my wife and I, having done a little bit of research, decided that we had no alternative but to move to within the catchment area of a good comprehensive school, uh, a good state school. And um, we decided to move um, to um, Suffolk, to within the catchment area of a school called Thomas Mills. 
Um, uh, and it, that just happened to be where my parents-in-law lived at that particular time. Um, uh, and um, uh, But at the last minute, you know, just when we were thinking about putting our own house on the market and viewing some properties in Framlingham in Suffolk, um, I suddenly had a kind of um, conniption. I thought, I thought, I thought, well, hang on a second, you know, I'm a taxpayer, you know, uh, 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 why isn't there a decent school that I can send my children to where I live in Acton? Why should I have to turn my life upside down, move halfway across the country just to secure something that should be available to everyone um, across the country? And, um, uh, you know, it's just wrong. And um, uh, and at that particular time, um, uh, there was a Labour government, but the Conservative Party were talking about, if they were elected, making it easier for parents and charities and teachers to set up schools, replicating the Swedish free school policy or the charter school policy in the United States. Um, and at that point, it looked as though the Conservatives might well win the next general election. This was about a couple of years out of the general election in 2010. So I thought, I'll get a group of people together and I'll try and set up a school myself. And then when the Tories win a majority, um, it'll be possible to do it. Um, and I wrote a piece for the um, Observer, um, uh, a British newspaper, a Sunday newspaper, uh, I think in August of um, uh, 20, 2009, um, saying um, I wanted to do this and uh, inviting anyone who, um, who wanted to help me to get in touch. And about 150 people contacted me and I held a meeting at my house and about 50 people crowded into my front room. And out of that group, a group of about 12 people emerged who were willing to do the heavy lifting. And that became the steering committee of the West London Free School Project. And um, within two years, within a year, um, the Conservatives didn't win the general election, but the, uh, they did well enough to create a government in coalition with the uh, Liberal Democrats. Michael Gove, who was the great spokesperson for the free schools policy, he became the Secretary of State for Education. So it did become easier for groups of parents and teachers to set up schools. And because we'd already done some of the uh, groundwork, we became the kind of um, path beaters. And we were the first group to sign an agreement with Michael Gove to open a school and we were one of the first schools to open in um, uh, 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 2011. I remember Boris Johnson, who was then the mayor of London, opened the school and um, made, a, made made quite a good joke um, at the opening ceremony. He said, yes, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State uh, for Education, has given a new word to the English language. Uh, we give, they gave, he gove, he gove us this school. Um, <laughs> perhaps he had to be there. Um, but uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, we, we were told all kinds of things um, by, by opponents of the free schools policy. And being, you know, one of the first free schools, uh, if not the first, um, we were very much in the firing line. Um, and there was an enormous amount of quite well organised opposition uh, from the teaching unions, from the Socialist Workers Party, um, uh, by various left wing journalists, the educational establishment, the Labour Party. So, you know, it was it was a, a real political battle. And I was suddenly plunged into kind of uh, the front line of this battle without having had much campaigning experience. But it was actually, you know, uh, for the most part, great fun. Um, and all the things we've been told by the critics of the policy, you know, what what parent would possibly want to entrust their child's education uh, to a school set up by a bunch of amateurs. You know, uh, you got to leave it to the expert. Why would and it would be like a parent sending their child to a hospital run by patients if they got appendicitis? You know, you're you're tripping if you think anyone's going to want to come to this ludicrous crackpot school. And um, uh, and, and of course, you know, it was the most oversubscribed school in the country. You know. Uh, 10, 15 applicants for every place. Um, we were told, um, you know, um, we made Latin mandatory and we offered children a classical liberal education. Do you want to uh, talk about why you've got a fascinating explanation as to why, for example, Latin is is compulsory? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, there are there are a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, there there is there is some evidence, albeit quite limited, um, that. Um, uh, learning Latin because it is such a logical language teaches you how to think in an 
orderly, logical way. It makes it easier to learn other languages because of the similarity between some of the uh, Romance languages and Latin, Spanish, Italian, French. Um, uh, also, you know, it's uh, it's it's a it's a door, uh, a doorway into the ancient civilization onto which our civilization has been built. Um, uh, and it's it's uh, it's you know you see all these Latin inscriptions on statues and on buildings. And uh, once you begin to pick up a bit of Latin, you realize what it is they say. And, you know, you then it opens a window into another civilization, which was our predecessor civilization. Um, uh, and, um, you know, so there were a number of reasons why. why, And it also just I think it sent a signal that we were a traditional old fashioned sort of school that wanted to teach children traditional old fashioned. Can you subjects talk a little bit about in the time we have? those traditional old-fashioned values of the school that, as you say, parents overwhelmingly want for their children. Yeah, well, we, we described it as um, a comprehensive grammar school. Um, so um, a school which is open to all children regardless of background, religion, ability, uh, but which has the same standards as a good old-fashioned grammar school. Um, so uniform, houses, uh, competition, um, uh, very high academic standards and ambition to get every child into a good university, um, a fairly demanding behaviour management policy, so zero tolerance of disruptive behaviour, silence in classrooms, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, th 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 this, this particular model um, has uh, also been called now warm, strict, um, neo-trad, and the evidence from not just the UK, but from America and around the world, uh, uh, the, the, the evidence is overwhelming um, that, um, uh, that, that th th this kind of education, this approach um, uh, is much more effective, gets much better results than a more progressive, child-centered approach. You know, essentially it's about restoring the authority of the teacher and placing the teacher at the centre of the classroom and expecting the children to um, uh, uh, do what the teacher says, treat the teacher with respect and write down what the teacher's telling to them, uh, telling them and, and, and commit it to memory. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not rocket science. Um, uh, 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 most people who went to a school like that uh, will recognise that um, that is a far more effective way of educating children from all walks of life than a more free-for-all, progressive, child-centred, project-based approach. Um, but good God, it's, it's, it's a battle that hasn't yet been won and I think it's still raging in Australia. In the, in the time that we, we have, can I ask two final questions? The first one about education. We've had many parents, grandparents, young people seek to ask me to ask you, what is your advice to someone who's been confronted by cancel culture in a big way or a small way, someone who is a teacher in a, in a classroom or a, or a staff room, wanting to inculcate some of the values that you've been talking about. What is your advice to someone who wants to stand up for freedom and express their opinions or their, their, their thoughts? What is your advice to them? Often it's quite hard to give uh, general advice because each situation is often very different. Um, and we like to think very carefully and find out as much as we can at the Free Speech Union before actually giving anyone who finds themselves in difficulty any advice. Um, but um, I think in general, um, my advice would be, first of all, um, find some allies. Make sure you're not alone because you're not alone. And there will be other people probably in the school who uh, think the same things you do, but have just been cowed into silence. So by hook or by crook, uh, without being, um, without necessarily immediately putting your own head above the parapet, try and find some allies, uh, create a WhatsApp group, start strategizing. Um, uh, try not to inadvertently um, trigger any tripwires. Uh, often the people we, 
we, we, we end up helping. And people who've used particular words that they didn't realise were taboo words, like um, describing a female author as exotic. I can think of one example of someone who got into enormous trouble, placed under investigation, their life turned to misery um, because they described a female author as exotic without realising, perhaps naively, that exotic was a was a taboo word as far as the kind of linguistic thought police are concerned. So make sure you don't inadvertently give your enemies any ammunition by triggering any of these invisible tripwires. Um, uh, and um, you know, once once you've once you've, I think I think when when you're setting out your stall, uh, try and do it uh, when when you finally do set out your stall and make your case in a kind of. Uh, public forum do it in as reasonable and as considered and as thoughtful a way as you can you know um uh, try not to be too confrontational initially you know make sure that um uh, for people in the middle for people who haven't made up their minds which is the vast majority of people for people who haven't taken a position on one of these kind of controversial hot button issues um you know make yourself appear reasonable and informed and flexible and moderate um so when they attack you with absolute hysteria and brand you a racist and a transphobe and a homophobe or god knows what else an islamophobe you know they're the ones who look extreme and unreasonable and intolerant uh try to avoid i mean one of the th one of the lessons i've had to teach myself john is you know as a journalist my inclination is to be provocative and controversial and inflammatory uh and you know that served me very well as a kind of uh, journalist you know writing opinion pieces for the last 35 years but if you're setting out a policy and you want to win allies and build a coalition and actually win an argument and get a policy through that is not the way, needless to say that is not the way to go about it be reasonable be sensible think politically um uh force your opponents uh to be the unreasonable immoderate ones and uh you're much more likely to win that way We've had a wonderful discussion over many topics. Can I ask a final question before we conclude this edition of IPA Encounters, Toby? Are you optimistic about freedom for the future? I'm not particularly optimistic in the short term. Um, you know, people are constantly asking me whether I think we've reached peak woke. And um, even though the, the Free Speech Union keeps winning individual battles, I still think that um, the war at this point isn't going our way. Um, the, the institutional capture by the woke cult um, is, is so great that, um, you know, the opposition is only just beginning to organise. And, you know, if you think about the long march through the institutions, that's been going on for 75, 50, 75 years. So the idea that we can reverse that, you know, overnight or within a few years is for the birds. Um, we have to think about uh, the long haul, you know, reversing this institutional capture um, is going to be a generational battle, not something we can win overnight. Um, but um, I'm confident that we can win in the end. Um, uh, if we organise and if we're sensible about it, um, you know, we, we keep winning elections, after all, um, uh, certainly in the UK. Um, uh, uh, it look, looks like the next president of the United States will, will be a Republican. Um, uh, you know, uh, we keep losing these cultural battles, but we keep winning at the ballot box. Um, uh, and it's got to be and that, 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 that tells us, I think, that the majority of people, of ordinary people, you know, if given the opportunity to voice their views, are on our side on most of these issues. If you ask people about their support for free speech, you know, huge majorities support free speech. Huge majorities, you know, think that um, they're no longer able to speak freely. They have to, they complain about having to look over their shoulder and having to self-censor. You know, the support for free speech, for open debate for intellectual tolerance is overwhelming. We need to harness that. Uh, but I think I think uh, the fact that there is that su that support is still there. The fact that the woke cult have yet to take you know the majority of people with them. They're like the communists who ran the show before 1989. Everyone was terrified to speak out. The 
the extent of the opposition was was largely unknown because people were so cowed um, uh, uh, and unwilling to kind of speak up. But actually, you know, once 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 you once, once what we need is a Berlin Wall moment. Um, uh, 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 we need we need we need to we need to we need everyone to realise that the emperor isn't wearing any clothes. It won't happen overnight. You know, it'll be the work of decades, I fear. Uh, but I do think in the end we'll succeed. Toby, that's a wonderful way to finish this edition of IPA Encounters. Toby Young, thank you so much for being with us and I hope we can talk again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.